Hello, and welcome to our first webinar of the year, ASH 2021 Comes to You. I'm Robin Brumble, Director of Scientific Affairs and Research for the CLL Society, and I'm also a registered nurse. At CLL Society, we are dedicated to bringing credible and up-to-date information to the CLL community because we believe smart patients get smart care. Each year for over 10 years, CLL Society reviews hundreds of CLL-related abstracts from the American Society of Hematology's annual meeting to deliver you the latest, most credible CLL research. This includes the data, which is most likely to impact your current or your future CLL treatment. At CLL Society, we know that it is critically important for all CLL patients and their caregivers to have access to this cutting edge research from ASH, as well as to have it explained to them in patient friendly terms. At this time, I would like to introduce our moderator and speaker, Dr. Brian Kaufman, Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of CLL Society. Thank you, Robin. I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, and I would like to welcome our audience to today's event and introduce our first speaker, Dr. Anthony Mato. Dr. Anthony Mato is well known to you as the director of the CLL program at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. He's been the principal investigator on numerous clinical trials that have benefited the CLL community and is currently overseeing several ongoing clinical trials, some of which are actively enrolling patients. Dr. Mato regularly contributes to articles in peer-reviewed journals, and he's the chairperson of the CLL Society's Medical Ad Board. He will be discussing important data from clinical trials on BTK inhibitors, BCL2 medications such as venetoclax and PI3 kinase inhibitors, options for those who developed resistance to BTKs, I'll look at some of the cardiovascular risks and much more. Dr. Mato will also review data about COVID-19 vaccine responses for CLL patients with a breakdown on treatment status and the importance of receiving uh, booster shots. Dr. Mato and I will be answering questions at the end of this event, so please take advantage of that opportunity and ask your questions in the Q&A box. Dr. Mato's camera will not be turned on for the presentation, but it will be for the Q&A sessions. Thank you again for joining us today. And now to my friend and CLL researcher and clinician, Dr. Anthony Mato. Hello, my name is Anthony Mato from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. A special thanks to the CLL Society for inviting me to present today here on the ASH 2021 meeting. It was a really exciting meeting uh, to be at, lots of new updates um, that offer great hope to patients, and I'm really happy today to share with you just a small snippet of some of the abstracts and presentations that were included at the meeting. I wanted to start by discussing frontline CLL. There were several presentations at the meeting of interest, uh, largely focusing on newer or targeted therapies. Um, I'll start by discussing what we call the Alliance Trial, and this was presented at the ASH meeting by Dr. Jennifer Woyak. Uh, the official title is AO4-1202, and this was presented a couple of years at the plenary session at the ASH meeting, um, really highlighting how important this, stu this study is. This is a trial looking at ibrutinib-based regimens, either ibrutinib with or without rituximab as compared to the old standard chemoimmunotherapy combination, bendamustine rituxan. We call this a randomized trial. This is a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one randomization looking at BR or the chemo versus ibrutinib with or without rituximab. Of note, you could have some high-risk features like a deletion 11Q or deletion 11P to participate in this trial. And the primary endpoint is something that we call progression-free survival. This is the main uh, point of the study, progression-free survival. Follow-up here is 55 months, so patients have been followed for a long time on this trial. When you're reading a Kaplan-Meier curve, you're looking at the three different treatment regimens, the ibrutinib-based therapies, or the purple and the blue, as compared to the green, which is the bendamustine-based therapy, 
And you can see here that the progression-free survival for ribrutinib with or without rituximab is better than bendamustine rituxan. This is one of the first and key trials that really helped us to understand that the targeted therapies are better for most patients than chemotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy combinations. The other thing I'll highlight from this data is that you can see the ibrutinib curves are superimposed on one another, meaning that rituximab did not offer a particular benefit for patients uh, as compared to ibrutinib by itself. Because patients with the deletion 17P could participate on this trial, it gives us insight into whether or not the ibrutinib-based therapy is able to overcome in part that poor risk feature. So let's start with the bendamustine first. The green curves are bendamustine rituximab, Clearly, huge difference between those who do not have a deletion 17P and those that do. These curves are separate. No one in 2022 should be receiving bendamustine rituximab if they have a deletion 17P or P53 mutation. But look at the ibrutinib curves. They're nearly superimposed on one another. There's no real difference between these curves, suggesting that ibrutinib in part or largely overcomes this poor risk feature associated with CLL. The other window we got in, uh, from this study with longer-term follow-up were the occurrence of cardiovascular events for patients treated with ibrutinib. These include atrial fibrillation and hypertension. I wanted to highlight, first of all, that all BTK inhibitors can be associated with those events. But here, specifically comparing ibrutinib as compared to bendamustine rituximab, you can see a much higher risk of atrial fibrillation, all grades or high grade and a much higher risk of hypertension as compared to bendamustine. So as practitioners and also and patients, we need to be aware of some of the unique toxicities associated with targeted therapies. Another trial presented at the meeting was presented by Dr. Peter Hillman. This is the NCRI FLARE trial, looking at ibrutinib plus rituximab as compared to chemotherapy combination FCR, fludarabine cyclophosphamide rituximab. And if this design sounds familiar, we had a very similar study called ECOG 1912 in the US, which made a very similar comparison with the primary endpoint, again, being progression-free survival. One major difference between the US study and the European study was in the US, if you were 70 or older, you could not receive FCR or participate. In, the, in Europe, they made that cut off at age 75. With that being said, the primary endpoint here was again, progression-free survival, Follow-up is quite long, 53 months. And here you can see that, that ibrutinib with rituximab was superior to uh, FCR. And so another trial demonstrating that targeted therapies are better than chemoimmunotherapy combination. And if two studies wasn't enough, we now have a third trial presented by Dr. Constantine Tam. And this is a randomized trial called Sequoia, looking at a different BTK inhibitor. This is called Zanubrutinib and zanubrutinib was randomized against bendamustine rituximab in a one-to-one -one randomization with the primary endpoint again being progression-free survival. Different cohorts here, we're focusing on cohort one. You could not have a deletion 17P to participate. More than 400 patients participated in this trial, and you can see the same story. The targeted therapy, in this case zanubrutinib, was better than the chemotherapy combination in terms of progression-free survival. 85% of patients were in remission uh, and doing well at 24 months as compared to 70% of patients. And then to give you a window into the future, the German CLL study group under Dr. Barbara Eichhorst presented a trial called CLL13, which is an interesting study. Four arms, more than 900 patients. And here's a comparison of chemotherapy choice, FCR or BR, versus venetoclax-based therapies, venetoclax plus rituximab, venetoclax plus obinutuzumab, venetoclax plus obinutuzumab with the BTK inhibitor ibrutinib. And while I won't be able to tell you about progression-free or overall survival, I can give you a window into depth of remission measured by something called MRD, minimal residual disease. The best way to think about this is if you're MRD negative or undetectable at this sensitivity of 10 to the minus fourth, that means that if you look at 10,000 cells, less than one in 10,000 cells will be a CLL cell at the time of completion of therapy. And the take home here was that when we looked at chemo versus R, uh, rituximab plus venetoclax, no difference in MRD rates. But when we looked at VEN plus OBIN, 
86.5% versus 52. When we looked at the triplet Vanobin Ibrutinib, 92 versus 52. Clearly the doublet Vanobin or the triplet were better in terms of inducing deeper remissions. We don't know whether this will translate into benefits in terms of progression-free and overall survival, or whether the, whether the depth of remission between the doublet and the triplet are clinically meaningful. One thing I can show you though, and it is of interest, is that as you add more and more and more drugs to venetoclax, probably the side effects change unfavorably for patients. And you can see for the triplet, the um, infection rate was 22% versus 14%. And the rate of serious infections, or what we call febrile neutropenia, were 7.8% versus 3.1%. So there's a price to pay in terms of side effects for adding more and more therapies together. I'm still not sure whether or not this is better than this in terms of output and in terms of endpoints like progression free and overall survival. Next, we'll delve into relapse refractory CLL and I'll highlight the Bruin trial. This is a trial looking at the next generation uh, non covalent BTK inhibitor, Pirtobrutinib, uh, in patients with relapse refractory CLL and lymphomas. I happen to have presented this data at the ASH meeting with tremendous honor. And I focused my presentation on the 252 patients with CLL who had previously received a covalent BTK inhibitor. I'll get right to the punchline. This, this figure is called a waterfall plot, and this represents every patient with CLL who participated in this trial. And down represents a reduction in lymph node size, up represents an increase in lymph node size. And anyone can see from this figure that nearly every patient who received pirtobrutinib had a reduction in lymph node size. And this was regardless of whether or not they had seen a covalent BTK inhibitor like ibrutinib, the reason for discontinuation like toxicity in the dark blue bars, or uh, rather a progression in the dark blue bars versus toxicity in the light blue bars, or even in patients who'd seen things like a BTK inhibitor plus venetoclax. The response rate was 68%. But with longer follow-up, for the patients who are on the study the longest, that response rate is actually even better. And then just to highlight a little bit more, this is what we see in terms of progression-free survival for the study. And the way that I read these two curves, the fact that they're overlapping, suggests to me that there's no patient population either resistant, intolerant, with or without a BTK mutation uh, indicating resistance to a prior agent that, that could not have a durable remission uh, in response to pirtobrutinib. And then of course, if when a drug is active and new, we also wanna know a lot about the side effect profile. And the side effect profile was quite favorable here. Very few events reached uh, a percentage of 15% of patients or higher. The BTK inhibitor associated events like hypertension and atrial fibrillation were low, 7% hypertension, 2% atrial fibrillation. And most importantly, the discontinuation rate due to side effect was quite low at 1%. Finally, I'll delve into a topic that's important to all of us uh, in the current times, COVID-19. Everybody is focused on uh, how well the vaccines are working for CLL patients. And there was one abstract in particular I thought was interesting that gives us a little bit of an insight in terms of number of vaccines, efficacy, value of boosters, and which patients are at highest risk of having an inadequate response to vaccination. Here we see patients treated with the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer or Moderna, and the groups are divided up into three groups. Treatment naive means watch and wait. Prior treatment means they got some treatment and they stopped either chemo or venetoclax-based therapy, or on therapy would be whatever you're on but still receiving it at the time of vaccine. This is the rate of humoral response, antibody production after two doses of vaccine. In the watch and wait, it was 72% in the prior therapy was 60%, and the on therapy was disappointing at only 22%. However, if you focus next on the patients who did not respond to two doses and you look, okay, if we give three, what happens? You can see for the treatment naive, another 58% of those who didn't respond previously respond to dose three. For the prior treatment, 58% respond to dose three. And for the on therapy, another 25% respond to dose three. Of course, I don't have any data yet on patients responding to dose four, but certainly every patient with CLL should be vaccinated. They should receive appropriate boosters, uh, and currently we're recommending four, boost, uh, four total doses for patients. So in summary, in the frontline setting, BTK inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors are more effective than chemoimmunotherapy for high-risk patients. 
use of BTK inhibitors can lead to certain side effects that we need to be aware about, potentially cardiovascular risk. Some of the newer agents like Acala and Zanu and maybe even pirtabrutinib are being developed and appear to have less of that cardiovascular risk. These drugs like pirtabrutinib and others that are in development may overcome BTK inhibitor resistance. The data look quite compelling that I presented. And then COVID-19 booster is recommended for all CLL patients treated with therapy and certainly all patients who are watching wait. And then of course, clinical trials should be the rule for all patients with CLL and other high-risk situations like Richter's transformation. I wanted to thank the CLL Society for inviting me. This was a great pleasure to participate in this event, and I'm looking forward to further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mato, for covering these important updates from ASH that were relevant to the CLL community, considering frontline and relapsed and refractory therapy, looking at COVID and much more. To round out the ASH 2021 updates, I'm now going to share with you my presentation that takes a little bit of a different approach to how these ASH abstracts can be looked at. Hi, Dr. Brian Kaufman here, the co-founder, executive vice president, chief medical officer of the CLL Society a retired family doc and a CLL patient myself. And I'm gonna be talking about some of the ASH 2021 abstracts that happened just in December of last year. And I'm gonna be focusing on ones that are of particular interest to patients. And I'm gonna start with ones that are gonna keep us very real, patients in a real world perspective. And of course, I'm gonna start with an abstract that's near and dear to my heart because you help make this happen. This is uh, our poster, the CLL Society's uh, abstract presentation of awareness, knowledge, and preferences of US patients with CLL and their caregivers related to finite or limited duration therapy and minimal or measurable residual disease or MRD. And this was presented by the CLL Society to the tens of thousands of hematologists that attend the American Society of Hematology's annual meeting. This is what the poster looks like, and it's available uh, on the ASH website. And we'll give a link to that for you to be able to look at this and all the other posters and abstracts. And I pulled out some of the material from it. So in the way of backgrounds, for those of you who've had CLL for a long time, such as I have, you can remember when the only therapies were these limited duration chemoimmunotherapies. And that all changed with the introduction of novel agents, such as brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors, acalabrutinib and ibrutinib, and now xanabrutinib. And this were, these were drugs that were taken as oral therapies until there was disease progression or we could no longer tolerate the medications. But similar to past chemoimmunotherapy regimes, some of the new treatment paradigms, especially those using venetoclax, are also fixed duration, meaning they're taken for a specific period of time, six months, 12 months, a year, two years, and then stopped. So the pendulum has shifted back also measurable or MRD assessment is becoming an important clinical tool. And we wanted to see what patients understood about this, what their knowledge was, what their preferences were in regards to that. So 630 of you were kind enough to respond, mostly patients. We had it up for about five months. And the patient demographics were pretty typical for CLL except that there were more female representation and having done a number of surveys, this is very common. Females tend to fill out surveys more than men. So even though there's more men with CLL, more women fill out the surveys. We were very proud that every state in the US was represented in this survey. So what did our results show? Well, when patients were thinking about what therapy was most important, I was really happy that the point came across loud and clear that overall survival was the most important parameter in deciding what therapy. 
That really is what should count the most. When they're forced to rank, it comes number one. Number two, a strong second was that there was no chemo. And that was 30% of the population. Everything else was in single digits, such as limited duration or ability to reach undetectable MRD. Now, what did patients think about when they should stop therapy if it was a limited duration therapy? And here, 63% of patients were ahead of what's happening in most clinics and saying that they wanted it stopped after reaching undetectable MRD or a pre-planned period of time if undetectable MRD is not reached. That is not happening in the world, but patients are saying, I want to be individualized. I want to look at the kinetics of my CLL. I want to see if I've reached MRD, and I want to make a decision based on that. That is the direction science is moving in, but that is not it, what is happening in the clinic. What is happening in the clinic is what 14% of patients preferred, that it be stopped after a planned period of time. What were the benefits of this limited duration? Well, I think the most obvious one to 91% of patients that it was very important was that they could be off of therapy for a while. And for three out of four patients, there would be a period of time without side effects was very important. When patients weren't forced to rank, but just say what was important to them, having a good option uh, to treat after finishing this treatment, if they relapsed, was important to 91%, 71% uh, choosing uh, chemoimmunotherapy, being avoided with uh, 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 over 60% uh, wanting the ability to reach undetectable MRD. We're going to move on to the next study. And this looks at an interesting uh, topic not just in CLL, but in all leukemias, including CLL. And this is what's called the mortality to incidence ratio. And what this is, is you take how many people die of the disease by how much of the disease is out there. So you're dividing the mortality rate by the incident rate. And it tells you what cancer survival is like for that community. And the worst MIRs, were found in Mississippi, Wyoming, and Ohio. And the best MR, MIRs, the lowest mortality rates, were found in Florida, New York, and New Jersey. So let's take a look at this. Now, the CLL Society has always emphasized the importance of having expert care. And I think we get that across very clearly with these mortality studies which show not only in CLL, but across all blood cancers, it's important. Because this MRI was linked with the state's health ranking. In other words, how many hospitals were there, the quality of care that people got. But that wasn't the only determinant. And this study raises issues. Should we be looking at social, economic, community, physical factors in determining what helps us survive a leukemia? And we should be looking more deeply at race and gender and age issues beyond the, the obvious advantages of having expert care. What other non-medical issues negatively impact leukemia outlooks, outcomes? We're going to look at this more specifically in another area. And to their credit, the Veterans Health Administration looked at the uptake of novel agents, abbreviated to NA, as a first-line treatment for black and white patients with uh, CLL. And we know, as we said from the beginning, that they shifted everything with their approval in 2013. But we also know that black patients have not done as well as white patients. And if we look at this bar graph, the orange bars are the African-American patients and the blue bars are the white patients. And we can see in the early years, there was a tremendous advantage to being a white patient in terms of being offered a novel agent. However, if we get up to 2017, we can see that the difference there is 
of only between 33 and 31 percent. So there was a significant difference in the use of novel agents that would be drugs like ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, venetoclax between black and white patients, but the disparity was largest in the early years and has mostly disappeared now. Addressing another issue, this is what happens to patients who've had double exposure or what we call double refractory disease. They both had a covalent brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Covalent refers to the way that the a brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor, the, DB, the BTK inhibitor, binds to brutin tyrosine kinase and all the available brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are approved, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and the off-label use of xanabrutinib bind that way. And the only BCL2 inhibitor that's uh, available, uh, which is venetoclax. And what if patients have had those two drugs, but now need a different therapy, what happens to them? And this was a look at 125 patients with a, a total of 211 cumulative lines of therapy. And what we found is the most common therapy that was used was a non-covalently binding BTK inhibitor. And the main one would be pertabrutinib, which used to be called Loxo305. And that is not commercially available. That's only available through a clinical trial. There is a new BTK inhibitor that I'll be talking about later that's also non-covalently binds that is also in clinical trials. The next most commonly used was a PI3 kinase inhibitor. Uh, the two that are approved in CLL are, are, are idelalisib and duvalisib. Transplants were also used, CAR-T therapy, again, strictly uh, uh, experimental, and chemoimmunotherapy, that's what the CIT stands for. Don't look too much at the ORR or overall response rates because those are deceptive. What you really want to do is go a row lower and look at the median PFS or progression-free survival. And when it says not reached, that's good because that means fewer than half of the people in terms of the follow-up have started to progress. And we see that's only true for the, uh, the pertubrutinib uh, uh, non-covalent BTK inhibitors and all others, the numbers were relatively short, showing us that this is still a significant unmet need, but there's reason to be enthusiastic about the not experimental non-covalent BTK inhibitors. Here's another way to look at this. And this is a curve where on the x-axis, we're following the time out. And on the y-axis, we're seeing what percentage of patients have not progressed, progression-free, and are still alive, progression-free survival, PFS. And if we look at the top curve on the left, uh, the closer to the top, the better, because that would be 100%. And we can clearly see that that top curve is the best curve. And we can clearly see the uh, curve for chemoimmunotherapy, CIT, in the bottom right is the worst curve. And in between, we have the transplant curve and the PI3 kinase curve. It's just a different way of looking at that same data. I'm now going to switch to some ASH abstracts that are news that we can use now in the clinic. And the first has to do with uh, the BTK inhibitors, a head-to-head -head trial of a calibrutinib versus ibrutinib. And this was in previously treated CLL patients. And then the way of background, there was a prior study that compared a calibrutinib and ibrutinib and showed that a cala was non-inferior, in other words, roughly equal uh, to um, ibrutinib and may have had improved tolerability. And this study looks at that improved tolerability in more detail. And I'm just gonna focus on the cardiovascular toxicities. There are other toxicities that are more similar between the drugs. Uh, in terms of bleeding risks and other issues and uh, uh, GI issues. And also the acalabrutinib may be associated with more headaches. But let's look at the cardiovascular data. 
And again, this is a curve where the x-axis is time, and we can see that we go out to almost five years here. And the blue line is ibrutinib, and the burgundy line is a calibrutinib. And we can lower is better because that's a lower incidence on this curve. And what we're seeing is that there's a higher incidence of atrial fibrillation, around 20% in the acalabrutinib arm, and a much higher incidence of hypertension, which seems to plateau out after a little more than three years, but almost at three out of 10 patients uh, with the ibrutinib arm compared to less than 10% on the acalabrutinib arm. So something to consider when you're looking at these two excellent options. Here's another paper on a combination of two of the best drugs we have to treat CLL, and that's uh, ibrutinib and venetoclax. We know that it's highly effective, but how durable are those remissions? And this is what's another one of these curves where along the x-axis, looking five years out, the nearer to the top it stays, the better. And we can see this curve stays close to the top in these 80 patients that were studied. And also in the notes, you'll see that some patients became MRD positive after two years, but additional venetoclax seemed to lead to undetectable MRD remissions in the majority of these patients. How that converts into long-term progression-free survival is not yet understood. So now I'm going to talk very briefly about some promising future directions from the abstracts. And some of this will get a little esoteric. In fact, all of the ASH stuff is more advanced, and there are things that people might get lost in it if you're new to CLL. But this is an iterative process, and we'll go over these things over and over again. They'll be available on the website, and gradually you'll get used to this language and understanding what's going on. So here's a study on venetoclax, obinutuzumab, and atelzalizumab. I hope I got that right. And that's a checkpoint inhibitor. So you've probably heard of the first two. Richter's trans these concern this, this study concerns Richter's transformation, which is when CLL goes bad and turns into a bad secondary cancer, usually diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. It's one of the greatest unmet needs in CLL. One of the background problems is CLL is a cancer of the immune system. So we have dysfunction of our immune cells, like T cells, our natural killer cells, uh, both in CLL and in Richter's transformation. Venetoclax, as we know, is a BCL2 inhibitor. Obinutuzumab is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, and they're active in both the Richter's transformation and diffuse large B cell. So this checkpoint inhibitor is not approved uh, here, but it's approved for melanoma, lung cancer, and other diseases. And this is a Nobel Prize winning kind of therapy. And what it does is take the breaks off the immune system, specifically the T cells, the natural killer cells, to allow it to attack the cancer, in this case, the Richter's transformation. And these are remarkable results. 100% of patients uh, had some kind of response, and uh, five of those were complete metabolic responses. Uh, this is very encouraging. It's very early data. How durable this is, we don't know, but I just wanted to point this out. This is only available in clinical trials. This is another way to look at this, and again, we're looking at that same Kaplan-Meier curve, and we can see the closer to the top, the better. So how long these remissions last, we don't know, but it's very interesting, very promising. Here's another tongue twister drug, epcoritamab. And this is a concept that I wanted to introduce to people here of a bispecific antibody. So as you can see in the picture here, there's a blue and a red arm, and it's kind of Y-shaped. And most antibodies, like rituximab or obinutuzumab that we talked about early, both arms of the Y are similar. But in this, one arm of the Y attaches to the cancer cell through CD20, which is expressed on CLL cells, and the other attaches to a T cell, CD3, 
And these are the cells that will attack and destroy the cancer. So it brings those two together very much like a CAR T cell does, but in a much easier way. And this is just a subcutaneous injection, just beneath the skin and injection. So that's what these bispecific, two specific antibodies on one antibody. Very small study, only five of the seven patients in re with relapsed refractory disease were assessed, but these were tough, tough CLL patients, an average of four lines of therapy first. Six out of seven had poor prognostic ma ma uh, markers, such as deletion 17P. Almost half had bulky disease. All of them uh, experienced cytokine release syndrome, so this is not a nothing therapy, but it was usually mild. Uh, fortunately, there was no neurotoxicity or tumor lysis uh, syndrome. The anti-leukemic effect in the doses that were used uh, with partial responses was seen in three of five patients, so stay tuned, a new therapy coming. Here's a couple other new therapies that I'm going to talk about. And this is a class of drugs that are degraders and they're being used both for BTK and for BCL2. So resistance to drugs that inhibit BTK like ibrutinib and acalabrutinib or BCL2 like venetoclax can develop when the targets that these drugs bind to mutate. Selective degraders don't need that kind of binding. What they do is they actually degrade or get rid of the actual protein itself. They actually destroy it. These drugs are called proteolyse targeting chimeras or protax. So stay tuned to watch for those. And here's just a short list of several interesting drugs that are coming. They 736 um, is an anti-BAF and BAF is related to the B-cell receptor. And sometimes when you turn off the B-cell receptor, as is done with ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, BAF is upregulated, it's increased to overcome that. And this is a way to prevent that resistance. LP118 is another drug that's in development. And again, the cancer can be very reactive and smart in terms of working ways around the uh, therapies. So when patients are resistant to venetoclax, sometimes there's another chemical that gets upregulated, more of it produced to overcome that, and this drug attacks that. Another tongue twister that I'll skip and just go by the letters, APG2575, uh, is a drug that may allow a faster ramp up of venetoclax. Venetoclax has to be begun very slowly to avoid tumor lysis syndrome. Sometimes patients don't have the several weeks that it can take for that ramp up. And this drug allows a quicker ramp up uh, in a more safe way, at least that's what they're trying to see, which may be an advantage for patients. And another drug, MK1026, or what used to be called ARQ531, is another orally available reversible non-covalent uh, binder of wild type in mutated BTK, a lot like pertubrutinib that we talked about earlier and Dr. Mato talked about. So in summary, patients' voices are increasingly be heard, but there's more to do. Inequities um, remain and must be addressed. Unmet needs are being researched, double refractory disease, Richter's transformation, and medication intolerance. And the future includes improved versions of existing classes of drugs and entirely new drugs. So I look forward to answering your questions and covering this. I know we've covered a lot in a very short period of time, and some of this may seem over your head, but it will get easier. And please feel free to ask questions, and we'll try to answer them. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope you learned something uh, new and exciting from uh, th these presentations. I'll remind people that the ASH presentations can be a little challenging if you're newly diagnosed. There's a lot of nomenclature.
but we're available to try to help sort that out. And don't worry if you don't get it all on the first time. It's an iterative process, like I said. We'll go over it again, and it'll become easier and easier to understand. I want to talk, thank Dr. Mado for taking the time from an incredibly busy schedule for his very clear presentations on some important topics. We have a ton of questions, and we're not going to be able to get them all. But if we don't get to them, you know, please email us at our Ask the Experts email, and we'll try to answer them that way. Uh, Dr. Mado, I'm going to start with what came in as the very last question. Actually, it's not the last question now because I see six more popped up. But this is the last one that I looked at just as things were ending. And that was all of these studies deal with older patients when you look at the age. This is a patient who was in her 30s who's saying, "Are there is there research going on for people like me who's going to have be dealing with this disease for 40, 50, 60 years? Yeah, good question. Um, that, you know, it's interesting because it's it's a more of a recent phenomena that the the average age on CLL studies are closer to the average age at the actual diagnosis in in the real world. Um, it, some of the studies actually, you know, some of the more um, relevant combination studies do have median average ages in their fifties, but certainly no CLL study has an average age in their thirties. Uh, or 40s because of the fact that the majority of patients who are diagnosed with CLL are way beyond age 70. Um, with that being said, it is an important topic. There are early intervention studies, one uh, by the cooperative groups looking at combination of venetoclax and OBIN as an early intervention for patients who are asymptomatic with um, poor risk disease, just one example. But you highlight a great point and that, you know, in general, our strategies for managing younger patients are different uh, than potentially managing uh, much older patients because our goals are to extend life and to try to sequence therapies to allow that to happen. So great question. Um, and you're highlighting a, a big unmet need, particularly for younger patients with CLL. There's a ton of questions here and both of us can uh, get into these, but let's deal with them. Uh, and they talk about the vaccinations and the passive immunity through Evusheld. And I know you've had, through your institution, a ton of experience with Evusheld. Just to set things straight and make sure we all have the same language, the way best to look at this is your first three shots are your primary vaccination if you're immunocompromised. And all CLL patients are immunocompromised. So for the regular community, Two shots is what they need, and then anything after that is a booster. A booster is to boost immunity that's waned after several months. So the fourth shot is our first booster, where the third shot would be a first booster for others. Uh, the CDC is now recommending a fourth booster for CLL patients, generally five months afterwards. And generally, the messenger, the mRNA uh, vaccines are the ones to go with. Um, that has the best data. And they seem to induce the best antibody responses. Uh, Dr. Mado, is there anything you want to add on vaccinations and how you're handling that and advising your patients? One question was, should that booster be a booster dose or a full dose? That's one question that has been asked many times. Yeah, I think... Um... So first of all, I completely agree with you um, regarding the strategy where all CLL patients should have four vaccines. Um, that is our general recommendation. And the fourth dose should be spaced out five months from the, um, the third dose. There's a little bit of a controversy. I'm not completely sure of the answer, uh, whether or not the fourth dose should be a half dose or a full dose. Um, certainly, um, in general, we've been recommending full doses for patients. But um, I, I'm not completely sure what the official guidance is from CDC on that. I mean, you, you might know better than me. Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure what the official guidance is from CDC either, which is a bit of a problem. But from what I've seen is that the immunogenicity, the response rates between half a dose and a full dose, at least in the immunocompetence, are negligibly different. But the incidence of adverse side effects, admittedly short term, but feeling miserable for a couple of days is higher with the fuller dose. So those are the only things to weigh in. I would take what's offered you at, at this point. Um, and I think that there is some evidence, and let's get a little controversial here, that if you have a choice, 
Moderna is probably the better um, vaccine if you have a choice to go for. It seems to induce better responses in the LLS and other trials. Would you go as far as to say that, Dr. Mato? I have not been saying that, um, but of course it is a controversial. I To me, they're equal. Um, um, I haven't seen any like long-term data or, you know, from the primary trials to support from a, the risk of severe COVID, any difference between these drugs. And so, um, you know, personally, I'll just state it for the record. I had the Pfizer because that's what was available to me. I didn't push for one over the other. Um, so I, I generally tell our patients, whatever's available and whatever you started with is generally what you should stay with. I also had Pfizer and had a good antibody response. So I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, and the last question on the J and about vaccines that we'll get to the J and J uh, vaccine. Uh, what are you telling your patients who started with the J and J vaccine? Generally, to switch to the mRNA series. Although I have to say, just thinking through all of my patients, I can think of under five patients total who ended up getting that. So I don't have any great clinical experience that I could rely on. Most of our patients at our center got one or the other um, mRNA vaccine. And so that's where most of the focus has been. There's some questions about Evyashel, and let me deal with a little bit of the timing of vaccinations and Evyashel. Evyashel um, is a passive immunity that will give you the antibodies so you don't have to make them, but it has no effect on T cell functions or stimulating the innate immune system or anything else. So if you respond to a vaccine, in theory, that would be a more robust response. So that's going to vary from person to person. The guidelines uh, recommend that you get the vaccination at least two weeks before you get the Evyshell. But I don't know of any science, any research that backs that up. That's just the guidelines. What if you've done it the other way? You have an opportunity to get the Evyshell and you get it. When should you get vaccinated? Well, in theory, the Evyshell should diminish your need for vaccination. And the worst that could happen is if you got vaccinated, the response may be less robust to that vaccine because your body's kind of lazy and it doesn't need to make the antibodies if they're already aboard. Again, there is no science to back that up. Uh, so some doctors are recommending waiting um, until the uh, Evyshell dose is significantly uh, diminished you know, three to six months out before getting vaccinated. How are you dealing with the Evyshell and the vaccine question from patients? Because I'm sure you're getting a lot of that. Good question. Um, I think it's a little bit of an unknown, to be honest with you. I have generally telling patients if they're getting Evyshield and they're due for the fourth dose simultaneously, uh, to wait two to three months post Evy Shield to be vaccinated because you are afforded a certain degree of protection to try to stagger it a bit. But I'm not really sure um, whether or not, you know, certainly that's not based on any significant data set that's been published. And I'm sure many physicians have a different answer to that question. I don't think that there's a, a firm, correct answer. There's been some adverse events associated with Evyshell. There was some concerns about some cardiac issues, but from when I looked into that, it seemed to me that it was extraordinarily rare and was mostly in people with pre-existing coronary disease and no uh, clear causative uh, issues. I've there are, you know, somebody wrote in saying when they read the ad potential adverse events, they declined the Evyshell. What are you telling your patients about the risks of Evyshell and whether they should go ahead and uh, get the uh, passive immunity through the monoclonal antibodies? So far, our experience has been very favorable. We've had um, several hundred patients at our center receive um, that drug, and I haven't really heard of any significant events. For someone who has an active coronary uh, issue, recent MI, active angina, recent arrhythmia, probably still not the best idea to give it based on the warnings from FDA, but it's, you know, it's on a case by case basis assessing risk versus benefit. So we do ask patients if they have any active coronary issues before making the decision to approve it or not. One of the big uh, options that is available to patients nowadays is to whether to go to a BCL2 and uh, uh, blocker like venetoclax, it's the only one that's uh, commercially available, or a BTK inhibitor. Are there certain 
uh, genetic characteristics. Um, I know that there's certain patient characteristics that you look at, but are there certain genetic markers that help us decide which might be a better choice for a patient if they have both options in front of them? Um, you know, to be honest with you, I think the short answer is no. I, I, there's this, I think there's this false sense in the community that if you have a deletion 17P, you absolutely have to have a BTK inhibitor. That's based on the um, sort of shakiest of evidence. Um, there are certainly compelling data from some small studies to suggest long-term outcomes are great with um, BTK inhibitors, and that's a reasonable option. There are a small number of patients treated with venetoclax in the frontline setting with a with a, where we have you know the average remission duration, about 53 months, but we don't know how patients do with retreatment and whether or not re that results in a durable remission. The short answer is that investigators in CLL need to conduct head-to-head -head studies in poor risk populations to try to sort out this question and mixing and matching data from different clinical trials really does not result oftentimes in the right answer. So um, fortunately, we live in a world where all of our targeted therapies work far better in poor risk disease than does chemotherapy. And then ultimately, we'll have to come up with the answer from clinical trials. So with lots of good options uh, in 2022, much better than a decade ago. When venetoclax was first approved, it was taken until uh, disease progression or until uh, uh, intolerance. And now we're seeing more and more fixed duration. How do you as a clinician make that decision about your patient, whether it should be a fixed duration therapy or whether it should be long term? What's, what's, what's happening now? I mean, the most attractive feature of venetoclax is the fact that it does induce deep remissions that allow for fixed duration schedules. So I would say it's the vast majority of our, our patients treated with venetoclax are receiving a fixed duration. I do think a little twist on that should be use of MRD to guide the duration of exposure. And we have a lot of studies at MSK where we're tweaking that fixed duration based on depth of remission. And I think that is a window into the future. The uh, uh, kind of mixing two things together, we've seen data from a number of studies now that show that patients with CLL who are on treatment, especially BTK inhibitors and anti-CD20 antibodies like rituximab or obinutuzumab respond less well to the vaccines. Um, the antibodies stay around for a long time. So if you've had them, you're stuck with them for months afterwards, maybe a year afterwards. Uh, but what if um, you're on a BTK inhibitor? Uh, are you telling your patients maybe to take a short drug vacation? Is that, I, I, I believe that there's some trials opening that are looking at that options. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um. Just re repeat that one more time, Brian. So yeah, so if, if a patient is on a BTK inhibitor and they need a vaccination and they haven't responded well to other vaccines, do you tell them maybe stop the ibrutinib for a week before the vaccine and two weeks after? Are you telling patients to do that? I no, know- no. I'm not doing that because it's, it's a completely unfounded practice. I mean, we really don't know when B cells will recover um, after stopping a, a BTK inhibitor. Um, but we do know that patients with CLL can have flares of their disease when we stop BTK inhibitors, particularly in the relapse setting. And so until somebody does a study prospectively really confirms that it improves the response rate to these drugs, it, it's not at all part of my practice uh, to sort of mix and match CLL therapies to try to induce um, responses to vaccines. I think it's a research question. If it's done on a study, maybe. But in clinical practice, it's, it's unfounded practice. And I, I do think patients should, the primary focus should be making sure patients get the most appropriate CLL therapy on the schedule that's approved by the FDA. And the, I think there is a study that is opening to look at that uh, particular issue. And I think in a clinical trial, that would be worth uh, uh, taking a look at. Yes. But there are risks of going off a of BTK. Some patients get this very accelerated flare of their CLL, especially from their first year or so of treatment. So it's not nothing to do this. Here, here's a sophisticated question. You and I know that if a patient takes an anti-CD20 antibody, which um, uh, targets a marker that's on normal B cells and cancerous B cells, it wipes out the B cells, and that's why we have trouble responding to vaccines. 
But what about the BTK inhibitors? We know that they work on CLL, but what's their effect on normal B cells? Well, BTK is an important enzyme in CLL cells and normal B cells. And so um, we know that BTK inhibitors will impair or alter the function, migration, replication of both normal and abnormal B cells. Um, the reason why BTK is so important in CLL is because it's an important enzyme in normal, B, in normal uh, lymphocytes as well, B cell lymphocytes as well. So it has some effect on the, um, the non-cancerous cells, but they're less addicted. They haven't upregulated the BTK to the same extent. So it's, it's a more minor effect. Yes, although we, you know, we haven't really seen great studies specifically looking at drugs like ibrutinib or acala or Xanu specifically on the non-malignant, you know, um, B cell compartment, um, particularly in large numbers of patients. So it's a little bit remains to be seen. What we do know is that patients with CLL in remission on these drugs, they may be still immunocompromised, but they're certainly not having really, really significant infectious complications. So it, you're right, it's probably a minor effect. I presented a paper that uh, looked at the head-to-head -head data of a calibrutinib versus ibrutinib and focused in on the cardiovascular um, differences and adverse events. There's already data that shows non-inferiority. In other words, the two drugs are basically equally effective. Uh, with that data showing a higher incidence of hypertension uh, and a higher incidence of cardiac arrhythmia, specifically atrial fibrillation, in some other concerns, maybe some heart failure concerns and some more serious arrhythmias. Are you one of the patients asked here, are you switching people from ibrutinib to acalabrutinib? Are you, when do you use ibrutinib versus acalabrutinib? Uh, you know, how are you looking at uh, those two drugs together? Well, you know, we have head-to-head -head data now specifically looking at the different BTK inhibitors in the relapse refractory setting. And it does appear, just let's focus in on the ACALA data, that from a relapse refractory patient population, that AFib is lower, hypertension is lower, um, just two examples with ACALA versus ibrutinib. With that being said, there are thousands and thousands of patients on ibrutinib in the country who are on it long-term doing well and aren't experiencing those side effects. So in general, I don't recommend for a patient doing well on a drug to stop it because of a theoretical concern. Um, also noting that there probably are more in our practice, more new starts of acalabrutinib than there may be of ibrutinib based on these head-to-head -head data. Our practices evolve over time, but you know, there are people who are now seven, eight years out on ibrutinib from the original studies, even longer doing well. And so you have to really appreciate the nuance of making that decision. Um, it, you know, certainly just switching somebody while they're responding to ibrutinib without side effects is probably not the best idea. Uh, there's a lot of interest in pertubrutinib. Um, are there trials open now for it and other non-covalent? Uh, how do people find out more about this class of drugs and also just touch on their activity in Richter's? Because I think um, sure. there's been some interest in that. The Bruin study, which is the phase one, two that I presented at ASH is open still for limited patient populations. And I believe one of those is Richter's transformation. So if you have a, if you happen to be uh, an unfortunately diagnosed with Richter's, that is something that's open and it does seem to be active. And there are some patients who have durable remissions. If you have CLL, the best way to get access to pure to would be consideration of the randomized trials that are underway. There is a randomized frontline trial looking at pirtabrutinib versus bendamustine rituximab as one comparison. There is a head-to-head -head study planned or about to open looking at pirtabrutinib versus ibrutinib in the frontline setting. And then in the relapse refractory setting, there are two randomized studies looking at venetoclax plus rituximab plus or minus pirtabrutinib as a randomized trial or appear to brutinib randomized to either idelalisib, rituximab, or bendamustine rituximab uh, in the relapse refractory setting. So four randomized trials open, but because of the impressive activity of this drug in the phase one, two, there isn't a trial specifically available where every patient will have access to peer to brutinib. And so they will have to accept the um, odds 50-50 chance in those trials of receiving peer to brutinib versus the control. 
Someone asked about why there's such a poor response to the vaccines in uh, COVID and when there's a better response with other vaccines. And I would, I would correct that and say, CLL patients generally have um, muted responses to all vaccines. And there's uh, studies uh, that, we pub uh, that we presented from the NIH and others that show response to the pneumonia vaccine, to the shingles vaccine is also very muted um, and is worse if you're on certain therapies like BTK inhibitors or the anti-CD20 antibodies. And in fact, the response to the COVID vaccine is better than to some other vaccines. People also asked if you didn't respond to the first two, should you get a third? And the data is encouraging, um, at least in terms of antibody formation, from um, the LLS studies and others, that a significant percentage of uh, patients who didn't respond, who were non-responders, became responders with the third dose and more become responders with the fourth dose. They also, also there was some just very recent data studied that showed that 78% of people who didn't respond with antibodies did respond uh, with a T-cell activity to the um, Again, very small study, but an interesting study. So there are benefits. So just because you didn't get a response to the first two, get the third, get the fourth, like Dr. Mado says. I think that that's incredibly important. Here's a clinical question uh, for you that I'm sure comes up a lot. How do you decide whether a patient should have monotherapy with a novel agent versus combination when we have all these great combos? Uh, but we also have great single agents and, you know, the people argue that maybe sequential is better than using everything at once, keep some powder dry. You know, when you're looking at a patient, what would push you to say, I'm going to use I plus V or V plus obinutuzumab versus I'll just put them on a, a great BTK inhibitor or put them on fixed duration ban or, or something. Well, I, you know, this is where I would say over and over again, research, research, research. We need the studies that ask these questions. And for the most part, the studies that have been conducted so far with the combinations have largely ignored the individual contributions of the monotherapies. And so we kind of are in a tough spot where we have great data for BTK inhibitor monotherapy. We have the combinations, we have the venetoclax CD20 and very, very limited data for comparing them against one another. And so as investigators, and I've said this over and over again in papers I've written, it's our responsibility to design studies and to conduct real world studies that try to answer those very questions. Um, and it's a tough, tough call because most of the combination studies, while they look amazing, probably on some level do over treat some patients. Uh, and there are probably some patients with poor risk disease that would benefit more so from, you know, intensive combination therapy. So it's, a, you know, we talked about data gaps uh, when you introduced the topic today, Brian, and I think this is one area where sequencing of therapies, registries, real world data, and studies that have comparisons to relevant control arms, I think are, are essential to move the field forward at this point. Otherwise, we'll be here 10 years from now having the same, com same conversation. I mentioned a couple other things. There was a question about CAR T therapy and whether it's potentially curative. There was just a paper that came out today in Nature, which uh, highlighted a case from UPenn of one of the very first of the three patients who got CAR T therapies 10 years out, who has no disease that's left. But uh, in you know 10 years out with no disease and persistent CAR T cells, that's beginning to smell like a cure. But I would say that's the exception in that most CLL patients should think of CAR-T as an important palliative therapy, a therapy that gives them some time, gives them a nice glide, but um, that not expect it to be their final therapy that they'll never need anything else. How are you fitting CAR-T therapies into your regime? Great question. I, I'm very excited about CAR T and other immunotherapies like the bispecifics that you just mentioned. Um, of course, everything at the moment is still experimental, and we just have very limited data for any of these therapies. I, I do think there'll be a place for both in managing patients with CLL. Um, of course, when the immune system is weakened with later and later lines of therapy, probably these therapies work less well. You need functional T cells in order for a bispecific or for T cell therapies to work. 
So right now we're trying to figure out studies that might move these up earlier for patients and potentially offer curative therapy with curative intent um, to more patients at earlier lines of therapy. It's a work in progress um, right now. Um, but I do think, uh, as you know, there are these patients who are long-term survivors after CAR-T and certainly speaks to the power of harnessing the immune system in different ways for treating CLL. I talked also about these experimental drugs that actually degrade BCL2 or degrade BTK protax. Um, somebody asked if uh, we could give a little bit of, of a better explanation of those. Um, and these are very early in experimental phases in CLL. Do you have any thoughts on those? Yeah, I mean, if it, it's a topic I'm really interested in because again, sequencing of therapies matters. If you have a covalent BTK inhibitor, maybe the next step would be a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. Maybe the next step would be a BTK degrader. As we understand more and more about the mechanisms of resistance to each of these classes of drugs, you can try to fit them into a sequence to help patients do well for long periods of time. Uh, they're really early in development. At our center, we have a study open right now looking at one of these degraders, which is able to utilize the machinery in the cell to, to degrade the specific protein. There are others in development. Um, if interested, um, reach out to an investigator at a center that's exploring this class to see whether or not it's appropriate for you. What I will say is, while the technology is really exciting, it's not a frontline therapy, it's not even a second line therapy, you really should be treated with the standard therapies first before exploring this class, but always happy to talk offline with a patient who may be interested. And someone asked about a bispecific, and maybe I can take that. So if you recall, antibodies are kind of Y-shaped, and the general antibodies like obinutuzumab or rituximab, gaziva that we're familiar uh, with rituxan, um, they, they target on both arms the same marker that's on the cancerous cell. But what a bispecific does is one arm targets the cancer and the other targets usually the T cell, a marker on that called CD3, and it pulls those two close together so the T cell recognizes the cancer cell. Um, that's, so it does the same kind of thing that CAR T does in a way, uh, and it just makes it easier. Am, it, am I getting that uh, correct, uh, Dr. Mato? Anything you wanted to add to that? No, that sounds like a great explanation. Um, the hope is to, you know, engage the immune system in close, pros, close proximity to the cancer cell and hope that the immune system takes over and does the job. And right now, these are also really early uh, in their development, but uh, certainly a promising class. We just need to figure out how to give them to patients safely and then what to combine them with to make them even better. So while we're talking about new drugs and ASH is about new drugs, one drug that class of drugs that I haven't seen much in CLL, but are active in other blood cancers are, um, let me see if I get this right, antibody drug conjugates or ADCs. Mm -hmm. um, do you see those? That have, can you explain what those are and uh, if those are going to have a future role in CLL? Yeah, ADCs are essentially taking an antibody as the... Um, Antibodies are very specific for a target. And so you can attach um, some chemotherapy to it and have it find its target and deliver the chemotherapy in a smarter way. They've made more of a splash in lymphomas. The best example would be Hodgkin lymphoma and brentuximab, but they've made more of a splash in the lymphomas, not as much in CLL. There's no reason to think that they wouldn't be an effective strategy. Uh, and certainly there are drugs that are in development that could be tested, but given the explosion of targeted therapies that don't contain chemotherapy, there just hasn't been a whole lot of research there as of yet. Um, maybe that's coming as we kind of shift towards more and more later lines of therapy, but right now it hasn't been a mainstay of, of our research and, and many colleagues. So a very specific question, uh, CLL in the brain, um, are there drugs that cross the blood brain barrier? I know it's quite rare, but it does occur. Um, how do you manage that? Extremely rare. Um, I would say most of the time, if CLL presents in the brain as a lesion or a spot on a scan, odds are that it's a transformation event, uh, a Richter's transformation. And so biopsy would definitely be need, uh, needed to prove that. The other flip side of the coin is many issues in the brain, like infection or inflammation, can draw those CLL cells into the spinal fluid, and physicians can be tricked into thinking that that's the problem. 
whereas the CLL cells are just there as part of the normal inflammatory cascade. So it, it's a topic that I think is way beyond the scope of this um, talk. It requires a really intensive thinking about the results, taking an accurate history and, in, and collaborating with neurologists in order to really make these decisions. If and when CLL has gone to the brain, there are drugs that do cross the blood-brain barrier. The classic is methotrexate, uh, but there are certainly some targeted therapies that may have a similar effect. I'm going to take a couple quick questions here. People are having trouble getting a third and fourth vaccine at some of the chain pharmacies like Walgreens and CVS. And um, one of the problems that we're trying to address is that um, CLL patients who are not in therapy are sometimes not considered immunocompromised when we know that they are. So my experience with this and what I've advised a lot of patients and what I've done myself is I go to a local mom and pop pharmacy and usually there's no problem there, but the chains can be a real stickler for, you know, the check mark and they don't, um, and if you don't fit into their box, they may not give it to you. But I've also known people who shopped around and gone to a two or three Walgreens and been able to get the, uh, uh, the vaccine. So um, that's one. Somebody asked about CAR T earlier on. And as Dr. Mato said, the earlier you get it, the better shape your T cells are in. But CAR T is a relatively toxic and can potentially expensive therapy. So um, trying it up front when we have such great uh, medications probably uh, doesn't make a lot of sense um, uh, at, at this point. While we're talking about CAR T and immunotherapies and cellular therapies, the ultimate one is transplant. Um, it seems like transplant still has a role to play in CLL, though that role is diminishing. That is true. Oh, however, again, as the pendulum swings and there are younger patients treated with multiple lines of therapy, it, it still is a reasonable option. And I would cite the data from the last two decades to support the fact that it is the only really known curative therapy available for patients in the relapse refractory setting that doesn't require a clinical trial. Lindsay Roker, my colleague at MSK, did do a study. She looked at about 65 or 70 patients who got a transplant following at least one targeted therapy, and the outcomes do seem promising. Certainly, um, it's, it's not anything I would do early on, but if you run out of options and your CLL is somewhat well controlled on your most recent therapy, it's something that's worth thinking about. Again, a very complicated conversation. The CLL physician is not likely the one to do the transplant, so this is a true partnership between the CLL expert and the transplant physician about whether the risks are worth any potential benefit. There's a question about CT scans and uh, when you should have them. And the guidelines, I think, are pretty clear that unless there's an indication, you don't need to do them. You've done some research on this, too. Uh, so you don't need one at the time of diagnosis unless there's something strange going on in your abdomen and your lungs or the doctor isn't sure what it is. And certainly you should do it. And as routine follow-up, you don't need. You should have a lymph node exam. But unless, again, there's symptoms, there's no need to do it. It does change quite a bit if you're in a clinical trial where they have to monitor the disease more clear, uh, closely. In terms of routine blood work, um, that I think is too individual of an answer to give. I think it's going to vary from patient to patient in terms of what that blood work varies, but most people have to have a blood count done and depending on their what that shows, may a simple complete blood count, CBC, that could determine whether they need more sophisticated tests done or not. Also blood chemistry, sometimes looking at the immune globulin levels, but all of these will depend on if your disease is in remission, whether it's accelerating, how often these things are done. I, we're gonna finish up here, but I wanted to give you it, uh, any thoughts you had about ASH, why ASH should be important for patients to understand, any, any questions that you got answered that you're excited about, or big questions that are remaining from ASH from your perspective as a researcher and an attendee and also as part of the faculty at ASH? Well, ASH is a wonderful meeting. It is the, the showcase meeting of the year where we see lots of um, exciting data. I think between the two of us, we got most of it. Um, uh, 
Certainly, there were many, many oral presentations and preclinical uh, and scientific presentations that are exciting, but I think we hit the highlights. Uh, and now I would say we're looking very much forward to attending meetings in person where there can be even more interaction, more collaboration uh, between um, CLL researchers, uh, um, physicians like yourself, and pharmaceutical companies to really try to design even better studies. So um, that's my comment on the ASH meeting, and uh, we're not that far away from the next one, and hopefully there'll be a great and exciting update from next year. Well, we didn't get to all 100 plus uh, questions that people asked, plus the dozens that were sent in advance, but I think we did a pretty good job. Remember, if your question didn't get answered, uh, please send it to Ask the Experts. Uh, uh, thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, and thanks to Dr. Mato again. I know how precious his time is with everything no that's going on. Please remember our event survey. We need your feedback. We want to know what we're doing well, what we're not doing so well, what we can do better. We have an exciting um, webinar coming up on March 18th on COVID-19 uh, with Dr. Josh Hill. Uh, Dr. Hill was one of the lead um, authors looking at um, um, remdesivir uh, for outpatient use in the pine tree study, uh, which is another uh, strong therapy option for immunocompromised patients who come down with COVID. And uh, one of your uh, friends and mine, Dr. Samir Parikh, will be uh, out of the Mayo Clinic, uh, will be talking about uh, uh, COVID too. And um, I remind you, if the CLL Society has helped you in your journey, uh, please consider helping the CLL Society continue our journey as we support patients and caregivers. And Thanks, everyone. Uh, um, I really enjoyed this and learned a lot. So I look forward to meeting with you next time. Thanks, everybody.